Greetings, church family. Greetings. Beautiful, beautiful morning. Nice and fresh outside. They've been blowing the leaves away. <clears throat> I remember, I think it may have been last year, they had the blowing machines going on during the service. That was kind of a challenge. We had to go out there and talk to them. They're still gathering outside a little bit, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name's Rob Smith, and um, together with you here in the church building, gathered just outside and watching from home, we remember the words of the Apostle John in his gospel from John chapter 4, verse 24, where he said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. If you're visiting with us this morning or are relatively new, we would love to get to know you better, and we'll have a time of fellowship outside. Uh, my wife and I have discovered that we spend just about as much time after the service outside as we do uh, here during the service. You know, it's, it's become a great time to knit together and, and visit and connect and fellowship. Um, we're going to have a um, guest table. It'll be set up in the back of the sanctuary. If you have questions about the church, about membership, if you'd like to get signed up for our weekly uh, midweek church email with all of our announcements and um, goings-on, uh, please connect with the uh, uh, folks back there at the guest table after the service, and they'll get you signed up to get the email. Well, by God's grace, <clears throat> our church was able to put together, at last count, 124 Christmas boxes up for Operation Christmas Child, and I think some more are probably still coming in. So we may, we may top 130, so just a great response. These Christmas boxes are going to travel all over the world to be given to children uh, who uh, often would not receive anything for Christmas, and there'll be a, a great uh, way of communicating the love of Christ to many who have not heard of Christ before. It's also our joy this year to once again participate in the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. It's named after the 19th century missionary to China, and it's an annual offering collected by Christians all over the world. 100% of the funds that are given to the Lottie Moon Offering do go to support international missions. <clears throat> Excuse me. On Sunday, December 20th, <clears throat> and again on December 27th, we'll be taking up, our, our, the, taking up the offering, church-wide offering for Lottie Moon. So between now and then, consider this part of your Christmas program for the year, uh, we ask that you would prayerfully consider supporting this ministry. And, of course, most importantly, we, we enjoin you to pray with us for our brothers and sisters who are on the front lines proclaiming the gospel to the nations. To help us learn a bit more, we, uh, I believe we have a video, a brief video to watch. Is that right? Okay, thank you. For many weeks, our churches have been unable to have physical gatherings. But by God's mercy, the Church of Jesus Christ continues. The Southern Baptist Convention continues. For 175 years, we have pressed forward together through wars, disasters, plagues, economic downturns, and political upheavals. Our effort of proclaiming Christ around the world has never stopped. Your support, your prayers, your gifts, all of us working together as the body of Christ have kept our missionaries on the field over the decades and keeps them there now. God is at work around the world in the most amazing ways. And he is using you, your family, and your church to help your missionaries, our missionaries, as they move forward with the gospel. The Derbyshires partner with churches in the United States to lead mobile clinics all over Thailand, using medicine as a means to share the gospel with those who have no other access. Christ is proclaimed. 
disciples are made and churches are planted. In Kenya, IMB missionary Kristen Lowry believes the very best place for a child is in a family. That is why she is working alongside national Kenyan partners to rescue boys living on the streets, restore their lives, provide shelter, a trade, physical and spiritual nourishment, and reunite them with their families. The Worthy family has recognized the importance of investing in relationships and in Italian culture, which is why they have planted their lives in Italy for the past 17 years. College students have dropped the term hard places from their vocabulary and are responding to go anywhere in the world where people don't have access to the gospel. We treasure Jesus and his gospel above all. But let us remember, we are not called to hoard the gospel, but to herald it far and wide. We are not called to stockpile the gospel, but to send it forth to those yet in darkness that they may see the light of Jesus Christ and live. Well, now let's take a brief moment in silence to quiet our hearts as we seek God's blessing on our service this morning. And then I'll be reading Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. The Temptation of Jesus, Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took, devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you. I will give you if, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word, the word of truth. The word of truth came to us in the form of your son, and truth comes to us Whenever we listen, whenever we read and meditate on your word, we thank you that this word is also our effective weapon, the sword of your spirit to defeat Satan in his attacks. Help us to invest our time, our minds, and our will to store up your word in our hearts and minds that we would be ready for the enemy's sneak attacks. We rejoice in your presence with us this morning. In the sweet name of your son, Jesus, amen. Good morning, Christ Fellowship. Let's stand and worship the Lord this morning with our voices and sing the Reformation song. My 
mighty rock on which we build. In every line the truth is found, and every page with glory filled. Through faith alone we come to you. We have no Sure that your promises are true. We place our hope in Jesus' name. Gloria, Gloria, glory to God alone. Gloria, Gloria, glory. To God alone. In Christ alone we're justified. His righteousness is all our plea. Your law demands our satisfied. His perfect work has set us free. Gloria, Gloria, glory to God alone. Gloria, Gloria, glory to God. grace alone we have been saved all that we are has come from you hearts that were once by sin enslaved now by your power of God in hell, oh, bless me, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground, 
his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ no guilt and lie no fear in death this is the power of christ in me from life's first cry to final breath jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand.
gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor. seated.
before we pray together, I'd just like to reflect on briefly uh, just some of the praises that we gave to the Lord uh, as we sang these songs this morning. O Lord, your word alone is solid ground upon which we are able to stand. You are the mighty rock on which we now live. In you alone our hope is found. You are our light, our strength, our song, and our comforter. When we were lost in the darkest night, being led to the grave by the sin that deceitfully promised us happiness, you looked upon our helpless state and led us to the cross. Now instead of heading toward the path of destruction and death, we are now able to experience your loving grace. Now, Lord, we would be yours alone that all might see these things. We only boast of you. All we know is grace and all we have is Christ. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, our creator and father, what a great privilege and honor and blessing it is to be here today and to be yours and to be completely covered by your grace and love and care. Even throughout this past year with so much uncertainty and, and unrest throughout our country due to COVID-19, economic problems related to COVID restrictions, political tensions, and general disunity throughout our society. Even in spite of these things going on all around us, you have blessed our local body here with your sustaining grace and love and with a spirit of unity made possible by Christ's sacrifice on the cross for all of us. And you have cared well for our church financially through the generosity of those who have led to be part of this local body in Williamsburg. And even with the COVID-related restrictions, we are able to gather together like today. And even now, almost the end of November, you have provided weather that permits us to gather together in one service with inside and outside seating all we know is grace, and all we have is Christ. Thank you, O oh Lord. And even, and we even thank you and praise you during our losses. Dick Green, Mickey Holcomb, and more recently Marshall Fleming, even though we grieve for them because they are not here with us now, we know they knew you as their Lord and Savior and are with you now in the presence of of your glory. Thank you, Lord. We do want to pray this morning for our sister, Kimberly Ferguson, as she is tending right now to her father, John Newman, who is coming to the end of his time here on earth. Kimberly is by his bedside right now. Please comfort her with your light, hope, and peace. She is truly your servant, and it shows in the way she lives each day with a great love for you and for your church and for her father and for all of us here. We pray that you care for John, and we pray that you care for Kimberly during this difficult time. And we ask you help us as her Christian family to do the same. This morning, we also want to ask you for your blessing on Operation Christmas Child, which many of us here have helped with, 120 boxes so far collected. We ask that you use this ministry to help bring much joy to those in need of it, and not just the temporary happiness type of joy that children have when they receive gifts. For while we do want the children to be excited and joyful over the shoebox gifts, we really ask that you use this ministry to bring all those involved the only true and everlasting joy that comes from responding to the gospel, the gospel message that has been included in each one of these boxes. We pray the gospel message and your Holy Spirit will speak to all those involved, those preparing the individual boxes, those processing, organizing, and transporting the boxes, the children, the parents, 
and all the Samaritan Purse volunteers and staff. We ask you to use this ministry to introduce many to the gospel and create with them a hunger and thirst to know you. We pray that many children will respond to the 12 lesson discipleship program included in the boxes, and we pray that many parents will work through the program with their children and will themselves be also granted a hunger along with their children to learn more about you. And Lord, we ask you, give us here today a greater desire to see the same gospel message, the good news of what Christ has done for us, spread throughout the world, and not only through a ministry like Operations Christmas Child, but also through how we live our daily lives. And Lord, now we come to you asking that you prepare our hearts and minds for the blessing that you have this morning in your word to us. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It was very encouraging to hear how the Lord has used um, this church and all of you, and including those outside and also watching from home in this uh, effort that we put together for Operation Christmas Child. Praise God that we're able to put together so many boxes for these children. May God use that. That's a real encouragement. Also want to say uh, just, you know, an early happy Thanksgiving. I won't see most of you, obviously, before Thanksgiving, but I hope that you have a wonderful time with family and with friends as we take a day. Uh, so grateful that we still do this as a culture where we say thank you to God. And Thanksgiving is not about turkey and it's not about football. Uh, Thanksgiving is about thanking God for the blessings that he has given us. And we certainly want to continue to pray that he would show his grace and his mercy to our nation. And this is a good reminder for us to do that. And of course, we're going to be continuing this morning to look uh, at this topic of spiritual warfare. And so I want to ask you if you would to take your copy of God's word and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 10 to 20 as we read it now, but then most especially we'll be studying verse 17 this morning. So let's stand together when you have your copy of God's Word there, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20, and then we shall read this. I'll read as you follow along. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is God's word. Please be seated. Well, it's, uh, it's a magnificent passage, isn't it? And I hope as we have taken the time to read through this passage each week, and I trust as you have read God's word on your own, you've been encouraged to grow in thinking about this matter of spiritual warfare, something that if you are a follower of Jesus, you're involved in, whether you realize it or not at a given moment, you're involved in this war, and as I thought about that reality, I, I thought about the, just the fact that I've always been kind of interested in the American Civil War. I haven't studied it as well as other people have, but I've always found the Battle of Gettysburg to, in particular, be a pretty fascinating engagement. It was really the deciding engagement in the war between the North and the South. Before Gettysburg, it seemed like the South had enough power, enough military might to be able to make the North sue for peace. But then after Gettysburg, the back of the Confederacy was broken, and the defeat of the South was inevitable. And among the many skirmishes that took place on, you know, really over a few days, but in particular during that Battle of Gettysburg, probably the most important 
was the fight for Little Round Top. Little Round Top was a, a high hill that was to the very far left flank of the Union Army, or the, of the Union Army. and a, a man by the name of Joshua Chamberlain, who commanded the 20th Maine, was in charge there. And he was told that he had to defend that hill at all costs because there was no one to the west of him, no one to the left of him. And if the southern soldiers were able to come up over that hill, take that, they would then have what they needed to go around the back and destroy the Union, the, the union Army. And that is exactly what the southerners tried to do. Actually, they attacked Little Round Top some six times, and Chamberlain and his soldiers, they resisted manfully, they fought with everything they had, until eventually their ammunition started to run low and they had no way to repel another charge. And in that moment, Chamberlain decided what they needed to do was to fix bayonets and to charge down the hill, and that's what they did. They charged down the hill into the attacking Southerners, and the Southerners were stunned by that, and they surrendered, and Little Round Top was saved. And Chamberlain ultimately went on to earn the Medal of Honor for his actions. It's really an amazing story. It's amazing to us because Chamberlain and his men were exhausted, and they didn't know whether or not they were going to win, and they were running low on supplies, but instead of quitting, instead of giving up, no, they pressed on, and they fought, and we look at actions like that in war, and we find them to be appropriately heroic. But imagine with me this morning if the battle for Little Round Top was different. Imagine if Chamberlain was there and he and his men were assured, 100% assured beforehand that the Union was going to win the war. But instead of fighting, instead of fighting in that battle, they just kind of pulled back, moved off their station, moved back to comfort and safety and watched the battle. You know, perhaps they gave into doubts as they look at how many Southern soldiers there were. Perhaps they were afraid. They didn't want to be killed in that particular engagement. Perhaps they grew discouraged because they were running low on ammunition, and so instead of fighting hard, no, they just kind of pulled back and gave in to that fear, and they didn't fight. Even if the Union Army had won Gettysburg, what would we think of their actions? Yeah, we would think that they were cowards, weren't we? You know, to be assured of victory but to fail to fight is really the definition of, of cowardice. But I wonder if you've ever considered that it's possible for Christians to give in to that kind of cowardice in their lives. You know, as we've been studying over the past several weeks, we've seen that we are involved, all of us are involved in a vast spiritual war between God and Satan. But the thing about this war is the end is not in doubt. It's not like we're unsure about how it's going to finish. We know that King Jesus is going to win. We know that by God's grace, we are on the right side. We're on the side that will be victorious but even though we know that, if we're not careful, we can give in to fear. You know, we can give in to doubt. We can give in to discouragement. And so instead of fighting hard, instead of giving it our best effort each day, instead we can just kind of pull back and disengage and give up and fight. And indeed, that's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to give in to that kind of spiritual cowardice. Well, this morning, I hope we'll be encouraged to consider once again that Jesus Christ has won the victory, and because he has won the victory and welcomed us into that victory, has given us that victory in him, we have everything we need to fight well. I'm praying that God will help us not pull back, but instead to be bold and courageous. So we're looking at the book of Ephesians coming to the end of this magnificent book. Two weeks ago, we began a study of what Paul calls the whole armor of God. We said that these are these pieces of armor that Paul kind of lays out for us here. These are spiritual resources that God has given us to help us to engage well, to fight well in the spiritual conflict that we find ourselves in as followers of Jesus. So far, we've studied four pieces, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes, which are the readiness given by the gospel of peace, and the shield of faith. So let's just remind ourselves of what those are. You know, the belt of truth, we said, is objective truth. It's having our minds equipped appropriately to think like God thinks. It means that we have to know what God has said in His Word, but we also have to practically use wisdom and being guided by the Holy Spirit so that we are able to recognize truth from deception in this world as we live our lives. And that's so vital. Why? Because Satan is the father of lies, and we are surrounded by deception at all times. So we need the belt of truth. And we need the breastplate of righteousness, and the breastplate of righteousness is not our own acts of righteousness. 
So if we try to put our righteousness before Satan and explain why we're so powerful, he's going to be able to look at all we've done, and he's going to be able to shoot holes in it and point out ways that actually, no, we were just being proud, or there was a flaw here, or look, you're just doing this because you want people to see you there, and so we're not going to have what we need to stand. So instead, we don't point to our own righteousness, which is flawed. We point to Jesus Christ's righteousness, which is perfect, and when we do that, All of Satan's accusations and all of his charges, well, he can't say anything about that because Jesus was perfectly righteous and we are perfectly righteous in him and so his accusations are silenced. We talked about the shoes, which are the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And it's the idea that we have peace with God. So as we go into warfare, we're rooted, we're standing firmly on this reality that God is not against us, but no, in Christ God is for us and so we can fight well. We don't have to listen to what Satan says. Instead, we can be confident as we battle against Satan and his demons. And then last week at the end, we said, well, the shield of faith stands for trusting in God, depending upon God, his character and his word. Taking up the shield of faith is in doing that. When Satan shoots in his, his fiery darts of doubt or accusation or fear or pride or lust, whatever it is, We lift up the shield of faith by believing in who God is as he's revealed himself in Scripture and what he has said about himself in Scripture. And so those arrows just kind of bounce off because we're not listening to the lies and they fall to the ground because we are using the shield of faith. And now in verse 17, we're just going to work on 17 today. We're going to see two final pieces of armor that God has given us to engage in spiritual battle, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. And as we study these two pieces of armor, we want to learn, by God's grace, two truths this morning. So two truths will be the outline for the sermon if you're taking notes. In spiritual warfare, we must hope in our salvation. That word hope is a strong word. It's not a weak word. That's a strong word. In spiritual warfare, we must hope in our salvation. We'll see that in the first part of verse 17. And a second truth, in spiritual warfare, we must skillfully use God's word. And we'll see that in the second part of verse 17. Let's look at that first truth together then this morning. In spiritual warfare, we must hope in our salvation. Look at your copy of God's Word, and let's see what Paul says. And take the helmet of salvation. Just a few words there, but there's so much to say about the reality that God has given us this helmet of salvation. So here's the fifth piece of armor. It's the helmet of salvation. We're supposed to take it up. Remember, as we're going through this study, Paul has in his mind's eye a Roman soldier. So he's looking at the garb, the outfit, the uniform of a Roman soldier, and he's working his way through those pieces, and now he comes to the helmet, which is the helmet of a Roman soldier. And again, this was a defensive piece of armor. Have you noticed up to this point that all of the pieces of armor have been defensive? Why? Because we're called to stand firm. That's what he wants us to do, to stand firm. The helmet was usually made of hard metal. Like iron, it was kind of shaped around the head, obviously, of each individual soldier. It would have an underlining of felt, some kind of soft material, perhaps even sponge, that would soften it as it sat on the head of the soldier. Sometimes it would have a visor that would protect the face. And the idea is that the helmet is used to protect the soldier in the midst of combat, because if a soldier is hit in the head, he will either be knocked unconscious or perhaps stunned. And either way, a blow to the head would cause the soldier to be vulnerable to attack. Now, you've got that picture in your mind of a Roman soldier, but remember, a few weeks back, we were talking about the breastplate of righteousness as well. Just at the beginning of this whole study, we said that there's also an Old Testament allusion here. So Paul also has in his mind the words of the prophet Isaiah from Isaiah 59, because the prophet Isaiah also spoke of a helmet of salvation. In Isaiah chapter 59, verses 15 to 17. Let me read what he says there. The Lord saw it, and he and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. So here's this glorious image of a warrior, garb for war, dress for war, except this warrior is no human. This isn't the believer. This is God himself who, looking upon the broken state of this world, realized there was no one, no mortal, no human who would be able to work salvation. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
And so God himself came to work salvation. If your idea of God is that he's kind of a grandfatherly figure in heaven somewhere, and he's a nice person, and he wants you to be nice, and sometimes he likes it if you pay attention to him, you know, particularly if you have trouble, you don't understand that throughout the Bible, God is pictured as a warrior, and he's not going to lose. He's going to win. It's a picture you see in Isaiah. He's a a warrior. And that means that God is the source of victory in the Christian life. We have to remember that. If you're fearful that you're not going to make it, remember you're not the source of victory in your life. God is. And indeed, God has already won this glorious victory. He puts on the breastplate of righteousness. He puts on the helmet of salvation, and he works salvation for himself. How did he do it? He did it through Jesus. Now, the decisive engagement in all of history is the cross. You know, we were broken by our sin. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that that we were made by God in order to have a relationship with him that would be marked by love, by service, by just walking with him. I love the picture of just walking with God that you see in the early parts of the Bible. But our first parents, Adam and Eve, they listened to Satan's lie, this great adversary, this fallen angel. They decided it would be better to live for themselves than to live for God. They decided it would be wiser to do what they wanted to do rather than do what God had commanded them to do. They thought it would be better for them to be the king and queen of the universe rather than let God be king or queen of the universe. And so they rebelled against God, breaking his command. And we send in them, and because we come from them, we have all inherited that same attitude, which is why from our very earliest moments, it feels very normal for us to say mine and me and give me and to try to take for ourselves. It's why our lives are characterized by those same things, by how can I make myself as happy as possible, even if I have to kind of push you this way or push you that way. We have all lived as if we're kind of the center of the universe, and that's not a light thing. That's a serious thing, because who is the center of the universe? Well, it's God, and we are not he, and he's a warrior, and he's a king. And he's told us in his word that to rebel against him is sin, and sin is serious because sin separates us from him, and it brings us under his just wrath. And friends, there's no way we can be good enough for God. When the Bible says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it's saying, hey, you already got a zero on the test. You're not going to pass the class. So don't try. Don't try. Instead, realize there's tremendous good news. If we were left to ourselves, our defeat, the defeat that we suffered from sin, would leave us exposed to the wrath of God, and we don't want that. We're not strong enough to endure that. The good news of the Bible is that God was not defeated by sin. God came himself to defeat sin. That's what Jesus Christ came to do. The eternal Son of God came to live the life that you and I, we failed to live. He always obeyed. He always submitted to the will of his heavenly Father. He was always righteous in his words, in his actions, in the things that he did. And then, when the moment was right, he lays down his life as a sacrifice. No one could take it from him. A legion of Roman soldiers were not able to take the life of the Son of God away. He laid it down sacrificially on the cross. Why? So that we could be forgiven. Because he was bearing in himself the wrath of God against the sins of all who will turn from their sins and trust in him. He died, but then he rose from the dead. And that's the victory that's historical. This historical event is the the premier demonstration of God's victory over sin and Satan and death and hell. And that's why if you're a Christian, you don't have to be afraid of death anymore. It's been defamed. It's this victory now that God has won through Christ. And what's amazing is you have this this image of, of a helmet of salvation on God, but then in Ephesians 6, you see that now this helmet of salvation has been given to us. The victory that God won through Christ at the cross, the Bible's saying now that's our victory. We've received that salvation. We've entered into the glorious victory that that God had won. God's helmet really is a helmet of victory in Christ. He's given us that helmet of salvation. We've entered into his victory. We've received his salvation. So what is the helmet of salvation? It's most especially for the believer the knowledge of the salvation that we have received in Christ, what it is, all of that, but then even more particularly, it's the hope that flows out of that. It's the hope of future glory. It's the hope of this glorious victory being lived out in our lives. Now, throughout church history, theologians have kind of divided the salvation that we've received from God into kind of three aspects. There's a a past aspect to salvation. We call that word justification. 
Justification is really salvation in the bud. It's like the little beginning of this plant, salvation in the bud. It's this great one-time event that happens when a, a person turns from their sin and trusts in Christ. God looks at that person and says, all your sins are forgiven because Jesus died on the cross to pay for them, and all of Jesus' perfect righteousness is now yours. It's this great exchange that happens when those who turn from their sins and trust in Christ. When that happens, they are justified declared righteous, which means we don't have to work for our salvation anymore because it's been given to us as a gift. It's wonderful. It's free. No, no human can earn it, so God himself came to win it for us. Justification. It's this past aspect. But now there's also a present aspect called sanctification. You know, sanctification is really kind of the flower as it blooms, right? All throughout our lives, we're like this flower that's blooming. Why? Because we're becoming more and more holy. So we're not saying you can just believe in Jesus and then go live like a devil because you can't. Because if you're truly born again, the very life of God is at work in you, and you're going to increasingly love more the things that God loves, and you're going to hate the things that God hates. And friend, if you're marked by loving the things that God hates, you haven't been born again. No, but if you've been born again, there's this principle. There's this spiritual life within you. It's going to bloom all throughout your life, and more and more you're going to be like Jesus. It's called sanctification. It's this present tense sense of our salvation. But then salvation also has a future aspect. We call it glorification, and glorification is salvation in full bloom. That's when we finish our warfare in this life. That's when we put off this body. That's when we die and go into the presence of God. In that moment, the victory that Christ has won for us, we begin to experience that in its fullness, and it just gets better and better. And one day, we even have a glorified body given to us. We live in a world where there's no more sorrow and no more regret and no more pain and no more sin. We live there forever. Glorification is what our brother, Marshall Fleming, experienced this past Tuesday when he passed through this veil of tears and he entered into a much much better world. We're going to celebrate the hope of that this afternoon. Now, it's important to realize all of this is included in the helmet of salvation, but remember, the helmet of salvation in particular points us forward to the fullness of what Christ has won for us in a special way. It is the hope of salvation. It's the hope that we have, and hope is not a cheap, chintzy thing. It's not a weak thing. No, that Christian word hope is a strong thing. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. Paul says, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. You see, because Jesus has already won a, this victory for us, because we've already entered into that victory now in him, now we have this glorious hope that we will one day experience the fullness of that victory. And it's this hope it's this, it's this confident assurance that we're going to enter into the fullness of the victory that Christ has won for us that gives us the strength and confidence we need to engage well in spiritual warfare so that we can resist, so that we can fight, so that we can, listen, not give in to cowardice. I like what Charles Hodge had to say about this. He said, that which adorns and protects the Christian, which enables him to hold up his head with confidence and joy, is the fact that he is saved. And we might add that he knows his salvation will be perfected in the end. So practically speaking, how does the helmet of salvation help us to engage in spiritual warfare? I do think that Paul's imagery here is really excellent because in battle, what can happen if you are hit with a full-on attack, full frontal assault, you get hit in the head, what can happen is you can be knocked unconscious. You can be stunned and so unable to fight. And in spiritual warfare, sometimes that's what Satan does. He hits us with a full frontal attack. And if we're not careful, we're going to give into fear and we're going to give into doubt and we're going to give into discouragement. That's what he wants to do. So let's spell it out just a little bit, okay? Just kind of work it out. How might this look in our own lives? At times in spiritual warfare, Satan will attack us through fear. He will point to distressing circumstances in our lives and he'll say, they're too hard and you're too weak, and you're not going to make it through this. He'll tell you that God has abandoned you. What's he doing? He's striking at the head. He's trying to stun you, right? He's trying to make you give in to fear. But if in that moment you have on the helmet of salvation, what? 
you have this confident assurance that you are going to be with Christ forever in heaven. Now, work it out logically. If I am one day surely going to be in heaven, that means that God must be willing to work in this present circumstance now to help me get to heaven. So he's not going to abandon me, but he's going to walk with me all the way until I safely reach there so I don't have to give in to fear. Instead, I can trust God for grace for right now, and I can have a wonderful confidence in the fact that I will be with Christ forever. And so I don't have to give in to fear. I can fight. At other times in spiritual warfare, Satan will attack us through doubt, particularly through doubt about our salvation. There are all kinds of doubts, but doubt about your salvation is a tough one. And what he loves to do is he loves to tempt us with sin. And then when he has gotten us to give in to sin, he then becomes immediately our accuser and comes along and says, you're not a Christian. Christians don't act like that. Christians don't do that. If other people knew what you did, you're not, there's no way you're a true follower of Jesus. What's he doing? He's striking at the head. He's trying to stun us now to get us to give in to doubt. He wants us to kind of curl up into a ball of self-pity and doubt, right? That's what he wants us to do. And here's the thing. Few things are more useless in the world than a Christian who's unsure about his or her salvation. Why? Why? Because they will automatically be so concerned about that. They'll be so focused on themselves. They'll be of no good to anyone else. And don't you know that that's what Satan wants for you? He wants you to be so wrapped up in you that you are of no good to anyone else. He can't take your soul. He can't take your salvation. All he can do is take your usefulness. And he will strike at you in this area of doubt in order to take your usefulness. But if you have on the helmet of salvation, if you have this great confidence that that you will be with the Lord, that Christ has truly won the victory, well, then you have all the grace you need then to fight back, right? You can say, yes, I'm a sinner, but Jesus has already won the victory over my sin, so I'm going to turn from this sin. I'm going to seek God for forgiveness, and I'm going to keep pressing on in the fight. There's a, another way he comes through discouragement. He'll attack us through discouragement. He'll point out how little we've accomplished for God. You've received this tremendous salvation. What have you done? And then he'll point us towards other believers who seem to be doing more than us. He'll say, look, those people are serious, but you're not serious. You're just kind of pathetic. He'll tell us we're worthless. He'll tell us that we're useless. What's he doing? Striking at the head again, now trying to get us to give into discouragement. But if we have on the helmet of salvation, if we have this hope, we can reason this way. Yes, my obedience is poor enough, but the very Spirit of God lives within me, and he can help me grow. He can help me change. He can help me press on to fight well for him. And so by his grace, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to keep fighting. You see, it's so, so important. It's This helmet is really the hope, which is a strong word. It's a sure confidence of heaven. And hope is a good thing. It's one of the best things we possess in this life is hope. Hope protects us from fear and doubt and discouragement so we can press on. Now, there's a lot more we can say about this, but let's just make kind of one observation before we move on. In the Christian life, we will suffer setbacks, but we will never be finally defeated. We just have to know that. We have to know in the Christian life, we will suffer setbacks, right? It's important to remember this. No one gets through the spiritual life unscathed. There's this much warfare going on. You're not going to make it through unscathed. Remember last week, we talked about Christian fighting Apollyon. Well, he was wounded by the arrows, wasn't he? He was wounded in the head and in the hands and in the feet. It's a picture of the fact that we will have times of stumbling. We will have times of setback. We will fail. We will doubt. We will fear. We will be discouraged. Perhaps if you're honest, this morning you find yourself there, looking quite good on the outside and yet inside just struggling. Well, if so, consider the helmet of salvation, which is to say consider that Jesus has already won the victory for you, brother, sister. He's already won the victory for you. The war is won. Now we're just in the mopping up action here of this battle. You're going to win. Press on. Don't quit. Don't give up press on. You will suffer setbacks. We will all suffer setbacks, but you will never be defeated. And that really just brings us back to the way we introduced the sermon, right? We talked about the fact that Christians can give into this kind of spiritual cowardice. 
Because even though we know intellectually that Jesus is one, we can still give in to the fear and the doubts and the discouragement of the enemy. And what we're hearing this morning is the helmet of salvation is given to us so that we don't have to do that. But instead, no, we can press on. So don't shrink back. Don't you love it? We're commanded in Scripture, don't shrink back. Fight. Don't give up. Press on. That's what we're called to do. Stand firm, right? Stand firm. That's the first truth. We must hope in our salvation. It's a second truth. In spiritual warfare, we must skillfully use God's word. Look at the second part of verse 17. Paul continues, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And of course, that verb take goes here too. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So, so far we've covered five pieces of armor, the belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the shield, the helmet, All of those have been defensive, but now, now for the first time, we get the sword, and the sword is for offense. This is an offensive weapon. It's given as a weapon with which we can attack Satan and his demons. Now, the word for sword there in the Greek is makaira. Makaira is not a large, broad sword. There was a sword called the rumphaya that was used by the Roman cavalry. Uh, But the Machaira is a a shorter sword. It was about two inches wide. It was about kind of two feet long. It was used for hand-to-hand combat. It was made in particular for thrusts and for stabs at the enemy, kind of precise motions, right? So what does Paul mean by the sword of the Spirit? Well, we don't have to guess because at the end of verse 17, what does he say? He says it's the Word of God. But it's really important to note that that word, word there, in the original language, it's not the general word that we use, which is logos. Many of you, if you've been in the church, you've heard the word logos. Logos is a general word for word, and it's a lot of words, but it's a word for word, and it talks of kind of God's word in general. This word, rhema, is the word that Paul uses here, and rhema, this shorter sword, well, it's a particular saying, right? The sword is a rhema. The sword is a particular saying of Scripture. It's a particular verse. So, for instance, Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39 is a rhema. So, the sword of these sayings of Scripture. I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a rhema. That is a saying of Scripture. It's a good word. Philippians 4.19 is a rhema. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory. Revelation 21 verse 5 is a, a rhema. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. So Paul is telling us that God has given us the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the word there refers to particular sayings, verses of Scripture. And we're to take those and we're to fight back. We're to take those and we're to go on the offense against the enemy. So what does it look like? Well, that's why we had Rob Smith earlier read from Matthew chapter 4, because in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, you have this amazing picture of what it looks like to use the sword of the Spirit. This is what Jesus does. Now, he's weary, he's alone, been fasting for 40 days in the wilderness, just as Israel was 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus, true Israel, is 40 days in the wilderness. Israel is tempted in the wilderness. They give in to sin. Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. He overcomes. How does he overcome? He overcomes with the sword of the Spirit. He overcomes by using the Word of God. Satan comes to him with three temptations, and each time Jesus trusts by faith the character and Word of God, and then he fights back with the sword of the Spirit. So the first temptation is this, Jesus, your Father isn't caring for you, Take matters into your own hand and make bread for yourself. What does Jesus do? He gets to the heart of the temptation and he goes to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verses 2 and 3 where Moses explained why God let his people suffer in the wilderness. This is kind of that passage. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 2 to 3. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives with every word that comes from the mouth of God. He resists the temptation, and then he strikes back with the sword. Man doesn't live by bread alone. In other words, God will provide for me. 
I'm not going to provide for myself. A second temptation, God's word says, and this is Satan here, God's word says that he'll protect you, so throw yourself down from the temple, right? Satan can quote scripture. That means we need to know scripture really, really well, right? So that we're not taken advantage of there. What does Jesus do? Now he answers back from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, which says this, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massah. So at Massah, Israel gave in to the temptation. They put God to the test, but no, Jesus would not do that. He trusted his father, so he would not put him to the test. He resisted the temptation, but do you notice that he did more than resist the temptation? He spoke back. He fought back. How? With the sword of the Spirit, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. A third temptation, fall down and worship me, and I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. This is blunt force temptation. Friend, have you ever been tempted to worship the devil? Jesus was. Blunt force temptation. Satan saying, you can escape the pain of the cross, have all the pleasure of the world, if you'll just worship me. But Jesus answers back now from Deuteronomy 6, verses 10 to 13 says this, And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord God you shall fear. You shall serve him. And by his name, you shall swear. Satan says, worship me. Jesus says, no, we worship God and God alone. He answers back with the sword of the spirit. I will worship and serve God only. Three times he's tempted. How did he respond? First, he trusts the truth of God's word, and then he speaks it back. And do you notice that he speaks it back precisely? that he speaks it back skillfully. We're called to do the same thing. It's not enough to defend. We must also, in spiritual warfare, go on the attack. And what has been given to us is the word of God, and in particular, the truths, the sayings, the phrases, the verses that speak back to particular temptations. And that, that is what causes Satan to flee. So what does it look like? Satan shows you how dark it's getting in America and tempts you to be afraid of persecution. What do you do? You fight back with Romans 8. The truth of Romans 8, 39. Satan, I'm sure that nothing will be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Satan comes along. You won't have enough money to make it this month. You fight back with Philippians 4, 19. Satan, my God, will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. Satan comes along and points to the utter brokenness of the world. Isn't it ugly and broken in so many ways? So sad. And he wants us to be discouraged. And you say, Satan, God is making all things new. From Revelation 21 and verse 5. Friends, it's how we use the sword of the Spirit. God's word is filled with truth, promises. Promises of God are so precious. These ramas, and if we will use them... We will be able to effectively fight back against the enemy. We resist first by lifting up the shield of faith, trusting in the character and word of God, and then we strike back how? By using these ramas, by using these verses, these passages. Now, there's much more we can say, but let me give you three very brief applications as we conclude the sermon this morning. First application, we must use God's word in spiritual warfare. God's word is powerful. It's a powerful sword, but if you don't pick up the sword, it will be of no use to you. So brothers and sisters, don't let your Bibles gather dust during the week. Pick up God's word. I can say nothing, nothing more basic, nothing more important to you than understand that this book has been given to you to give you spiritual life and every resource you need to live for God. And so you should just say, I'm never going to find time to read the Bible. By God's grace, I'm going to make time. And then you make time. And by the way, uh, a good thing to do is to put on your armor before you go into battle. Maybe the first thing I do in the morning is get up and spend time with God and his word and pray for grace to live for him that day. Maybe. Another application, we must use God's word skillfully as we engage in spiritual warfare. Do you notice again, notice how precisely Jesus used scripture. 
He got to the very heart of the temptation, and then he had the precise scripture that answered back the temptation. And the beauty of it, as you study, is that all he's doing is he is succeeding exactly where Old Testament Israel failed. Why? Because Jesus is true Israel. He's better Israel. And he's succeeding where Old Testament Israel failed. He is overcoming the temptation. The only one who's ever overcome the temptation of Satan, how did he do it? Uh, Use the sword of the Spirit. This is a very good reason to begin to memorize Scripture. Don't content yourself to say, well, I think somewhere in the Bible it says something about God being nice and wanting us to be nice. Memorize particular verses in the Bible that speak to particular temptations. It's such a good use of time. Such a good use of time. It'll be amazing to see the way the Holy Spirit brings that back in particular moments to let you answer particular assaults of the enemy. Third application, we must depend on the Spirit as we use God's Word in spiritual warfare. Do you notice that it's called the sword of the Spirit? Why is it called the sword of the Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit of God is the one who inspired Scripture. He's the source of it. And the Holy Spirit of God is the one who takes the truth of Scripture when it is spoken and makes it powerful. He makes it powerful and effective. He makes it active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So as we engage in spiritual warfare using the words, it's not enough to rely on ourselves. We have to be relying actively on the power of the Holy Spirit to take it and make it effective. As he would go up the stairs to his elevated pulpit to preach at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, Charles Spurgeon would stop on each step and say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. You take another step. I believe in the whole. What's he doing? Just active reliance upon the spirit of God so that as he spoke forth the truth of God's word, he knew God would take it and use it. And we must do the same thing as we engage in spiritual warfare. So we studied now these two final pieces of armor, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. And we've learned these two truths. In spiritual warfare, we must hope in our salvation And in spiritual warfare, we must skillfully use God's word. So as we come to our study of this, this, um, you know, looking at the whole armor of God, reminded of what William Gurnall said. William Gurnall uh, was a Puritan who preached many, many sermons on this passage. He said, our spiritual enemies are on every side, and so must our armor be on the right hand and the left. So over the last three weeks, we've studied these six pieces of armor. And what we need to take away now is that none of them are unnecessary. They're all necessary. If we're going to fight, if we're going to stand, if we're going to war in the way that we're called to war, it will be because we take the time to learn the resources that God has given us. And then by by God's grace, we'll use them as we go through the week. So may God help us do that in this coming week. And let's pray. God, we praise you as a great provider who has gone before us and won the victory for us through Christ, called us into that victory, and now has given us everything we need to engage in spiritual warfare, to stand firm, to not quit, to not give up, to not give in to cowardice, but instead to fight. And God, I pray that you would take the word that's been preached this morning and you would, by your spirit, press it into hearts in the way that only you can. And I pray in particular for those that are hearing these words this morning who don't know you, a Savior and King, uh, that they would see that Jesus is a glorious Savior and King. And they would turn from their sins and trust in Him. And I pray that you'd help each one of us, your sons and daughters, to walk before you with joy and grace and confidence because the victory is ours in Christ. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we enjoyed uh, some sweet worship this morning. I think we're just going to conclude our service this morning by, by singing the doxology. Let's stand together and we'll sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Let's say our benediction together. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated.
use the next few moments to think about what you've heard this morning and just a little bit. The ushers will begin.